Uh, into business podcast. Thanks, Scott. Mate, we're going to have a great chat. Look, I will say one thing about your LinkedIn uh, profile. Um, uh, your resume is very, very impressive. Oh. Um, thank you. But uh, but we're not going to talk about that right now. We're going to talk about football because uh, I know you're you're, you're a football, um, you know, and you've been involved with football as a player, uh, yeah. but also on 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 different independent boards and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, who's going to win the Euro? Oh, well, I would have liked to have said you, uh, England. England, yeah. yeah. They're not going to be doing it, I don't think, the way they're playing. Otherwise, if they do, they would have won it by playing crap football. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, unsure at the moment. Portuguese, yeah. Got the Ronaldo factor going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. I think Spain looked really good. Yep, yeah, did. Spain looked really, really good. Um, it always cracks me up. Though. I was in, I was in '96 uh, when the Euros were on in, in oh, the yeah. UK, and um, I just love that you know their whole song. It's coming home. It's coming home, yeah. and um, and I get excited every time for the English. But um, I think the expectation gets too much for them. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's just the, that level of. Um, you know, I read somewhere that they've got the most expensive team. Yep. You know, uh, at, at the Euros, but I think it's just that pressure um, of of playing. Uh, at at a tournament, just yeah. for some reason, doesn't help them. But in saying that, another lesson for every kid to learn: ninety fifth minute the other yeah, night. You know, ninety fifth minute, never give in. Nah. You know, I always say to my son: always chase the ball in football. Yeah. Always chase the ball. You're never out of it. Ninety fifth minute, Gillingham scores, and then they win two one. Yeah, I know. So yeah. yeah, what do you love about football? What do you love about team sport? Uh, team sport, I oh, just it, it's part of the team, eh? It's um, yep. again a, a team of stars won't be the star team. Yeah. So again, that that sort of aspect around yeah, it yeah. as well. It's how, how you gel, nice. how you go, play, how you just know where everybody's going. I used yep. to play footy with my brother. Yep. He was a left midfielder, I was right midfielder. Yep. I think uh, one season we were the top two goal scorers, and we but probably uh, set up each other's goals nice. because we just knew where each other was going to be. Yeah, yeah. We just had that. Uh, Who was your brother? Al. Al. Yeah, nice. oh, my brother, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I like about the team sport, eh? I used to do a fair bit of running in the day uh, well, when I was younger and Canterbury champ on that, but middle distance, but it was the only aspect. Yes. And the team team camaraderie on the pitch, off the pitch. Yeah. You know, like, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Sport, sports guys, actually talking to my mate about that before, you know, sports and, and getting kids involved in sport, I think it's a yeah, big thing, yeah, you know. Yeah. You, you have some things um, that I think it just teaches you um, as a kid growing yeah. up, you know, and, and being around other people and having to interact and socially, especially yeah. we're just talking about our kids and how much you know, they play video games and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it would concern me a lot if they weren't doing anything else, you know, but yeah. playing that team sport, my, my son loves football as well. Yeah. What sort of um, what sort of level of football did you get to? Uh, play, or well, when I was sort of heyday, National League wasn't in place, so yeah. I played Northern League, Central League, Southern League down here. Oh, great. Um, so basically the top level, what is now, the Southern Leagues, etc. Yep. played into the National League, so I was in amongst that. Um, but yeah, so it was never made national team or yep. anything like that. Played rep football all the way through. Uh, last rep team was under 20s, I think. And then uh, that was when I was down here, went up to Auckland. I was fast down here, went up to Auckland. I was slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just the quality up here oh, was yes. better. And then, uh, yeah, played through to I was 34, so I was one of the old boys out yeah, on the pitch. Nice. Uh, managed with the age group I'm at. I played against the uh, 1982 All Whites. Oh, well, the Spain yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys there, yeah, they good. were the old boys. I was the yeah. young boys. And then the 2010 All Whites, I was yeah. the old boy. They were the yeah, young yeah. boys. So I got to play on a Oh, that's guys. so cool. That pretty cool. Yeah. I played a bit of cricket back in the day with Glenn Collins and, and oh, yeah. uh, Ryan uh, Nelson. And, yeah, yeah. and they were they were good footballers, yeah, right? Yeah. They were good cricketers too, by the way. Like They could hit a ball. Yeah. Um, but I always remember going to... Um, uh, one of the gyms here, I think it was uh, Central, and um, there's Ryan Nelson, and they wouldn't yeah. let him in the gym because he didn't oh. have a membership, and but he had cash, he just wanted to go in. And I was going in to play squash with a mate at lunchtime, and he goes, Scotty, Scotty, can you help me out? Can you tell this lady that I'm a legit person? Yeah, yeah. And I was like laughing because I was like, mate, I don't know who you are, <laughs> you know, but like he could probably buy, he could have bought that building, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But he's just such a down to earth guy, he didn't want anyone to know yeah, or any fuss. Yeah. But yeah, what a what a character, and and kind of put football on the map there. Yeah, it is. You know, him and Winton Rufford, it's to yeah. some degree. Yeah, it's the thing like Winton was playing at the <clears> time before live streaming of football and everything else, so he, he's well known in Germany, yeah, yeah. You know, through Europe, but huge here, 
hardly anyone knows of him. Yeah. Ryan Nelson at the time probably was the highest sports person yeah. being paid in New yeah. Zealand at the time. Yeah. Media back here, yeah. hardly nothing no. about him. Yeah. yeah. Legend of the game. Yeah, totally. And I guess that's the coolest thing about, you know, now sports definitely global, you know, from a from a TV perspective, you know. Yeah. Kids get to see, you know, I don't think kids follow these days follow uh, teams as much. They probably follow the players, you yeah, know, yeah, and their, yeah. their, their, their players are the heroes, which is really cool. Hey, so we're going to talk about a couple of cool things today. You've obviously been involved in business, um, you know, in um, managerial positions on boards and stuff. But where, where did it all start out for you when it comes to, you know, did you go to university? How, how did it all start? Yeah, I did so uh, engineering degree, mechanical out of Canterbury. Oh, wow. So it was 91 to 94, many moons ago. Um, um, so yeah, went in through there. Went into worked up in New Zealand Steel up in Auckland. Yep. Uh, only lasted there about six months. Almost caused a uh, union walkout. Oh really? Yeah, I got got, got frustrated <laughs> with the mechanics or the maintenance guys not yep. taking an inspection hatch off. So I took okay. it off myself. Oh, hell broke loose on that. Yeah, and yeah. And uh, another thing, I wanted to change a limit switch to a pressure switch, and this old fella said to me, listen here, Sonny, you're not yeah, yeah, coming yeah. in here and changing the way. <laughs> so I learned pretty quick that wasn't the right fit for me. So, so Did you just see a better way to do stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and they yeah. weren't having it right. They'd yeah. done it that way for 30 years yeah. and just, yeah. 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 So did that just say to you, hey, this is not for me? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so um, ended up moving down to Wellington and then got involved in power stations, so okay. co-generation plants, yep. gas turbines heat recovery boilers oh, involved wow. in a couple of those projects uh, from conceptual design through to tender, tender award, construction, commissioning, handover. So oh, wow. I was a uh, site manager, construction manager on that. Got to a point it was right, go further in my field, have to go overseas. Yeah. Because um, where was that work being done? Yeah, so two projects. One was uh, Bay Milk Products at the yep. time, now part of uh, Fonterra up yep. in Edgecombe. And then the second one was Capena Gas Treatment Plant in the Naki. Yeah. Um, so in around there, so I spent what winter of '98 uh, up that way, um, putting in the, the plant over there. And then in '99, work most of the time over in Brisbane, working with uh, Tarong Energy and Stanwell Corporation, oh, wow. looking at some feasibility projects. So some big responsibilities there. Yeah, it was. It was. It was quite cool. Actually, it was part of a team. Um, yep. Bob and Midbar. He was probably my first sort of business mentor. Yep. Um, he's over in Brisbane now, living over there. Uh, he just sort of he took me under his wings, and away I went. Yeah. Um, nice. But yeah, sort of got to that point where I go overseas, learn more, come back. And then I looked across at my boss at the time. Thought, hmm, yeah, if I do that, I'll be doing the same as what he's yeah, doing yeah. in uh, thirty odd years. Yeah. So yeah. Moved out of that. Got into the operational management sort of side of things, yep. asset management, um, and then set up my own business 2004, and I was actually down, no, yeah, then 2004, and 2002 thereabouts, uh, doing some work with Rovers Down Fertiliser, yep. uh, another guy there, Mike Whitty, uh, great guy, he was the financial controller at the time, he sort of said to me, oh Mike, it's good to actually sit down and have a good financial discussion with an engineer. Yeah, nice. I'll never get that. And I yeah. Thought, yeah, I'm an engineer, but I'm more than that. Yeah. But qualification was a B, B in yep. mechanical engineering. So I thought, bugger that, I'll go do my MBA. So I did that. Nice. Yeah, part-time, working full-time, uh, 2003, four, five, And then... Um, now, so what did, what did the MBA give you? What, what was that? You know, obviously... Yeah, the way I described that is it gave me the... Sort of, you think of a jigsaw puzzle, right? Engineer starts off building out around the yeah. side and everything else, yeah. but where do those pieces go in, yeah. inside it? So the had some rough ideas, but the way I described the MBA let me know, okay, this piece goes there. Or actually that's nice. the mis missing piece that goes over there and it allowed me to form a, yeah. uh, the full picture of what business management and, nice. and the likes is all yeah. about. But again, engineer, yeah, one plus one equals two. Yep. It's always black or white. Yeah. Uh, put people into the mix. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't happen that way. Just uh, engineering degree doesn't cover that, so that was where I mm. self learning and everything else. Um, thought right, got to got to uh, up school around the people side. Yes, yeah. yeah. And then so so that kind of journey, yeah, I guess, were you just. The, the whole time realizing there's a bit more to your puzzle each time, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you said you started your own business though. So what were you doing? Uh, so it set up OPEX management. Um, yep. So at the time, I was working for another company. Uh, we were doing in asset management and industrial manufacturing sector. We were a team of ten of an organisation about six hundred. Yep. Um, we were the oddballs, and that everything else was sort of IT related. Yep. And we went to do a management buyout. 
Uh, that didn't quite go through as I expected it to. So um, me being me, I thought I'll bugger that. So I said, right, see you later, I'm yep. out, and went out and set up on my own. Set up your own, nice. So uh, yeah, again, that was focused on industrial manufacturing sector, yep. looking at asset management, lean manufacturing and everything yep. else, and went from oh, wow. there. Yeah, so that was 2000, March 2004, second year of the MBA, first child was on the way, June wow. August. <laughs> People thought I was mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but another mate of mine, mate of mine now actually, he, um, Glenn Senior. Yep. Uh, caught up. He yep. came in, guest lectured on the MBA. I said, Glenn, need to have a chat. And um, caught up a couple of times. I was looking for advice, and he mm. uh, said to him about the third time, "If we have another chat," he goes, "No." And I go, well, "What do you mean, no?" He says, "You're just looking for someone to tell you to go and do it. So just go and eat." Yeah, and do it, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. And, uh, I thought, oh, yeah, right. Oh. What was uh, what was holding you back? Ah, oh, just self-belief, possibly, yep. taking yep. that step out. Um, and again, a lot of people that were giving me advice around, oh, it's too risky, et cetera, yep. but they'd never actually done it themselves. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I think that's a key aspect I sort of take on board is where's the advice that you're listening to, yeah. where's it coming from, are they nice. experienced in that area or not? Glenn had been out there and done it himself. Yeah, yeah. So um, I thought, yeah, and again, I took the view of, if it doesn't work out, I'll just go get a job. Yeah. Basically go get employed somewhere else. Yeah. So. But it's a good, that's a good uh, takeaway, you know, to really, uh, who are you getting that advice from? Mm -hmm. I know a mate of mine went out in business and, you know, he asked me and another mate who had been in business for a while, you know, what do you think? And I, and then he asked and asked another mate and the other mate who had been working for someone said, oh, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah. And, you know, three years, four <clears> years <throat> later, um, you know, fairly successful business. But, but um, I think, you know, getting, the, getting, I think it's good to get both views, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, but at the yeah. same time, you know, like, I think you've got to back yourself as well, you know. Yeah, you do. And, yeah. And um, so what did you enjoy about that business? Uh, what, I can sort of probably freedom to operate and um, do, do things the way I thought that yep. could be done. Yep. Um, and again, part nice. of it, that is, I use a phrase, customise best practice. Yep. So again, you, you do all the reading and everything else around what is best practice, what does it look like and everything else, but no business is exactly the same. So no. that's why I sort of uh, coined the phrase, customised best practice, takes elements like out that. of everything, yep. hold that together and here's your solution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, I'm sort of someone who, don't give me a blank piece of paper because I'm useless on that. Yep. Give, give me a piece of paper that's got a problem or something or not quite right yep. and then that's where I'll start to yeah. Um, yeah, get excited about yeah, looking, yeah. Uh, how to do things better. Nice. Because that's the way your brain works, right? Like it's, yeah, it must you know, do. Yeah. it's engineered to, to, to bring it all together. Yeah. Um, obviously, the financial side you like, you, you know, but you've also got involved in other businesses, right? And I think one of the yeah. ones I, I wanted to talk today is battles, you know, Deep South yeah. and, and their journey there. So, how did you get involved in, in, in that? Yeah, yeah. So, we had OPEX management, so it was the consulting side. We then had uh, OPEX services where yep. we were going into manufacturing companies and yep. actually running the show. Yep. And then part of it was, oh, what's the next step? Was was that part of that lean manufacturing process yeah, as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah oh, lean cool. thinking and everything. Nice. So it was basically where we morphed into OPEX services was we were consulting into companies, but it was falling over through the implementation side okay. of the middle management. Yep. So effectively we said, well, we've got the team, we've got the crew, we've got the capability, let us implement nice. it. So we went and started to do that, and then the next progression around it was actually buy our own manufacturing company. Perfect. So my MBA project was actually around that OPEX yeah. group, and um, so then we started looking for a company. We looked at various types, and what, was that the model that you were like when you started? Was was that something you're always going to look to and, and lean towards, or was that did that just do you just spot opportunities and go, uh, hey, come on, this is there's a gap here? Yeah, or part of it, I always sort of think back, like in the. I was born in the 70s, but the 70s and all that, and before New Zealand was known as a manufacturing yeah. hotbed, yep. and then that had started to sort of die off um, and went offshore and everything else, and then actually from the New Zealand steel time, short period there, I actually saw a whole lot of inefficiencies in yeah. there, and I thought, well, that, that's why things are going offshore. Yeah. So OPEX, okay. in terms of stepping into that, part mm. of our, our goal, so to say, was how do we stop manufacturing going offshore? Yeah, nice. So it was in how can we do things better and more yeah. efficient. So that that's sort of the manufacturing bit. I like to make stuff. I always had with my dad when I was growing up, yep. we'd be out there making stuff. Um, so that sort of naturally came in around there. And then um, we just thought, oh, well, the next step is actually have our own manufacturing, manufacturing company. company. So we looked food and beverage. Yeah. We looked around here. We looked at probably six, seven companies. 
and ended up with an ice cream company. Yeah, how good. And I ate a lot of ice cream, so it was <laughs> ideal. So you're like, I, I think we could make this place more, you know, more productive. And, and, and so, so you started, was, was, was it a business that you saw there was a plenty of upsides? Like, Yeah, yeah. So deep sell the founders, the Simone Bryant in particular, his, his old man was actually accredited with yep. uh, introducing Hokey Pokey into New Zealand back really? in World War Two. Yeah, so okay, he good. was making ice cream in Dunedin. Uh, the honeycomb, honey crumble was a war ration that Cadbury's were manufacturing. They had offcuts of that. So oh, wow. Brian's old man got that, threw it into vanilla ice cream, it's hokey pokey. Probably my favourite ice cream. Yeah. So there, there was a lot of history story behind yeah. the product. Yeah. But the product was a great product, award winning. It was known to have the best yeah. vanilla ice cream, but yeah. it was just poorly marketed, branded. Yeah. The packaging looked crap, yeah. looked cheap. So you, we had a situation where we had opportunity. Um, one of the best vanilla ice creams in New Zealand. Yeah. Poorly promoted, branded, and everything else. So plenty of upside. Yeah. And if you went north of Christchurch, hardly ever no one knew about it. No. The only people that did were uh, shipped it out of Invercargill. Yep. So lots of upside opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why we we took the plunge on it. Nice. So so you invest in that, or yeah. you, you buy it outright? Like yeah, you did myself a business partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we and, it. and like, what was the what was that moment like? Obviously, really going in, not to put a pun in there, but into the deep end, right? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and and like you obviously knew the product was good. Yeah. Uh, did you, you know, you're an engineer, um, and you're thinking, okay, I can maybe look at some of the processes yeah. and everything that's going on. But what were you thinking from a rebranding and marketing perspective? Uh, yeah, we're just, so my business partner, he sort of focused more inside the four walls. Yeah. He was ex uh, New Zealand Dairy Group, etc., an old client of mine. So we yep. we teamed up and, and uh, under OPEX, so he took care of that. I was outward focused. Yeah. Uh, the OPEX business, I was always about the, the business development. And again, the MBA as well sort of taught me a few tricks of the yep. trade. And so again, I just, I don't know, branding, marketing, I don't nice. know what got me interested in it, but it did. And it was just right, how do we actually take this take this on, take it to yep. the world? Um, so again, a lot of what I do now and even back then is try and look at it through the eyes of the consumer. Yep. I sort of mentioned nice. before, I, I liked ice cream, so yeah. I knew, knew what good tasted like. Uh, but then it was all right, how are we going to set this up for growth? Yeah. Um, what do we need to do domestically, but more yep. importantly, internationally? Yep. So so the process, you didn't look at changing the name at all? Like just no. keep, keep the same name? No, no, we based because again, it had, uh, at the time, I think 28 years of yeah. brand presence. Yeah. You had the story behind it and yeah. everything else in terms of Brian's uh, father. So it was all about, right, what, how can we create the story around the Deep South and what does it mean? Yeah. And China was our focus market. Nice. So Deep South, Southern, yeah. clean, green, cold, fresh, all those sort of uh, connotations come and out around were, the name. Were you all always thinking of taking it to China? Yeah. Like, were you already, they already operating in China? Yeah, or, yeah. yeah they were? No, uh, they had two 20-foot containers a okay. year ago. So nothing so really right happening. No. Um, what were their sales like here? Uh, good in the South Island, South Island so yeah. we're in the North Island, yeah. um, so that was part of the growth strategy for us to be a, a, a real player internationally, we had to be dominant in New Zealand. And we're, obviously the capacity to grow was there, like the production side? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we, again we had two plant, two yeah. facilities at the time, Christchurch and Invercargill, yeah. we ended up shutting down Invercargill, which was a tough decision, yeah. um, but in doing that everybody had a job to yeah. go to once, when we closed the doors, nice. and um, that was about consolidating cost of goods, or cost of Manufacture, yep. um, but the facility in Dunedin wasn't fit for purpose. Uh, sorry, in Bacargo yep. wasn't fit for purpose either. Yep. Why do you reckon the product was so good? Like, what was the what was the go there? Was uh, it was premium. So this is sort of uh, a lot of people don't know. It. So premium ice cream got to be uh, twelve percent milk fat, so okay. cream content and lower ear content. So your cheap nasty ice creams will have I don't know five eight percent milk fat and a high ear content. Yep. So it's just tastes crap. Yeah. Um, but Brian, he he was a craftsman of the trade in terms of ice cream, you can yep. ask him, can you make X, Y, or Z? And then you go, yeah, sure, come back um, in a couple of days and I'll have it for you. Wow. And it was beautiful, but he'd have probably 2,000 litres of it. Okay. And, um, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, a real yeah. craftsman of his trade yeah. knew how to make a good Kind of like a craft brewer, like knows, yeah, yeah, knows yeah, how to yeah, make yeah, a... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's well interesting though, because when when was that? That's the early two thousands. Ah, uh, late two thousands. Between the earthquakes, we took it over. Okay, because yeah, because because ice cream has changed over the years, you know, yeah. like the obviously there's so many different brands yeah. now. You can get coconut, you can get yeah. all you know gelato. There's there's a whole bunch. So that would have been quite an innovative time, you know, when it comes to the ice cream. Yeah, world. it was. So we, again, we 
benchmarked ourselves against Hagen Das nice. um, because they were sort of the world leader yeah, over yeah. here. And, oh, nine slips, about another one. Um, but Hagen Das was your traditional type of ice cream, yeah. and that's what we wanted to be seeing. Yeah. You could have all the other ones with all the inclusions and everything yeah. else thrown in, but it's like you're eating a lolly scrap yeah. in your mouth with some ice cream in it. That's not where we wanted to play. Yeah, yeah. premium as well. Like, yeah. I didn't know that about the different types of ice cream, but yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of different, I know from you know, being involved in the small goods with bacon or ham, yeah. And all that, there's a lot of difference, yeah, you know, yeah. when it comes to the quality yeah. and what they put in to make them go a lot further. Yeah. What um, so when you looked at the rebranding, was it was it um, well positioning? What what were you obviously positioning for premium? Yeah. Uh, clean, you said clean and green. Like yeah. that was a that was quite, I guess a you know, massive catchphrase back yeah. in the day around. Yeah. What New Zealand was like? Yeah. So because we were small scale on the world stage, uh. um, didn't have massive balance sheet there in terms of finance yep. right what what can, how can we leverage off yeah, yeah. what's out there so that was like new zealand is known as safe uh good products uh clean products all that sort yeah. of side of it so the, the rebrand was all about how do we maximize emphasize the unique new zealandness of our yeah. brand so that was right with that sort of scope nice. and breadth on it um and who else what it, what's new zealand known for it's known for dairy yep. so how do we get all that sort of side and it's known for the outdoor mountainous particularly the south island yeah. so how do we get that into there and that's what we ended up with our brand uh, everything was about landscapes uh, the out, outdoor clean green all yeah. that sort of stuff coming in through that's very cool um so yeah terry um who we used from up in auckland was pretty legendary in, in yep. that area in terms of coming up with a concept yeah um he actually thought we were quite ballsy uh, because he said, oh, you didn't do a step change, you did a quantum leap change. Yeah, yeah. And um, it took us a while to get him to realise that that was what we were looking for. Yeah. We wanted to shake it up a wee bit. Yeah. So. And, and no kind of risk to some degree because you're going to go to a greenfield where yeah. you're only exporting like two yeah. containers. Yeah. What did, what did you, so so how do you get into the Chinese market then? So what are you, you going up there? What yeah, you, yeah, yeah. So basically got a market um, as soon as possible. So it was probably, we took it over December uh, 2010. Yep. Uh, first trip into market was uh, February 2012. Yep. It was really, so spent the first year rebranding, repositioning, getting the domestic market sorted. And then um, start of 20, 2012 was the first trip into market. Wow. Over the sort of six, seven years, I probably went up there probably 28, 30 times. Wow. And so how do you get? How did you get started in the idea? Yeah, like, New Zealand Trade Enterprise. Okay. So, yeah, they were... Uh, and were they, they created, were, was there a demand there for, for our product, for that type of product? And was there anyone else in the, in the market from New Zealand there? Uh, yeah, it's a New Zealand natural right Yes, yeah, okay. Um, so we sort again, interesting, we, we uh, competed heavily within the domestic market, yep. but then uh, up in, in, yeah, in China we were competing against each other, but we also worked in together as nice. well. Massive market. Um, if we had an opportunity or something approached us that we couldn't go for yep. because we were across the road or something or in the same uh, area, we'd let them know about it and vice versa. So Perfect. we sort of caught. Yeah, cooperated a bit up there. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah, the product was there. Um, we looked at dairy was a big product um, for uh, Chinese people. Yep. Um, and Hagen Das was on a, on a massive um, growth uh, yeah. pathway there. So we yeah. knew the market existed. Yeah. So the market existing, and you're, you're going in there with you know a pretty pretty decent product. What uh, what'd you learn from doing? Going 28, 20, 30 trips and going to China. Oh, heaps. Yeah. 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 Uh, Ate some interesting food. Yeah, 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 yeah. What about like how were you guys received when with the product that you had? Like, you know, like how did you get it? Like, obviously, trade enterprises are there, but how yeah. are you getting sales? Yeah. Like, so it... again, we we had both retail products and food service. Yep. So we're going food service first. Okay. Uh, easier to get into that yep. market. So uh, who would you be selling to there? Like, yeah. Rest so restaurant, restaurant chains restaurants. and yep. the like. So we're, we're big pizza wasn't our ideal target customer yep um, but they were up in Beijing they were a gourmet pizza chain okay. um, they had what 125 or 128 pizza outlet stores yep. it was a fam like family orientated um, restaurant they wanted something different they already had um, New Zealand beef and lamb on their pizzas Brilliant. as well but um, part of their serving good. so it was a natural fit in for yep. that so we used that to get into market to get it in people's mouths yeah um, and you NZT were real good they did a, a blind sample taste testing yep. um, with I think 200 people and we came out on par or above uh, Hagen Das oh wow so we 
So therefore we had the proof in terms of independent results. So that yep. helped us in the, the ability to open doors and, and get in and so good getting into 128 places straight yeah, away yeah. too right that's yeah. a i guess that's the thing the scale of op the opportunities overseas oh, it's right yeah. yeah yeah it's just massive so the china market we we were concentrated initially on uh beijing shanghai and guangzhou we treated them as three separate countries yeah because they're just so big so big yeah yeah, mm. and then so you can sell so much ice cream, yeah. right? Yeah. So was there anything special that you had to do for the Chinese market too? Was there certain sizes that they liked better than others? Yeah. Because like, so you, like, you don't learn a lot when it comes to that whole rebranding and marketing yeah, piece. Yeah. It's not just yeah, yeah, it's cream so, green and then green and stuff like nah, that. Nah, you're right on that. So one of the, the big learning experience, I was one of the guinea pigs with uh, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. They did a China immersion program. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, get, I got actually the opportunity to go into people's houses, open oh, wow. up their fridge and freezers without being arrested, basically. Really? So getting inside and talking to them, you got, you got an appreciation of what is the life, what's their life like. Yeah. And um, straight away you opened up the, like, we will probably got big chest freezers in the garage or yeah. whatever, etc. cetera. Uh, think of your um, caravan freezer, if you've got a caravan of the small type yeah. ice sort of boxes, that's what their freezer is. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, how good. Two liter ice cream's not going to fit in there. No. Um, so again, premium space, smaller sizes. Yeah. So we introduced a one liter range, a 500 mil and a 125 mil range. So, Brilliant. Yeah, specifically in three. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and because of that, you sell more. Yeah. You know, market yeah, intel yeah, straight away. Yeah. So how did, how did like, that's that's pretty fascinating, eh? Because, like, you can't buy that intel. No. Like, no, you, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, to actually go in and see that happening, you know, you would have just been, wow, okay, yeah. we're going to do things differently. Yeah. You know? So it's either, I remember clearly it was, um, what have been well, maybe about this time actually of the year in Shanghai, I was just out there, people watching outside a Hagen dazs store, and there was this young 20 something um, <clears throat> Chinese woman came out and she's got her Hagen dazs bag, which wasn't a freezer, wasn't a chiller bag. She's walking down the street like this with Hagen dazs with her ice cream in there, right? And I thought, what's going on here? It's going to melt and everything else, but it was all the brand association. Huh? So she wanted people to see that see. she was having Hagen dazs, dazs ice cream. Wow. And it was, wasn't a, wasn't cheap, yeah. right? It was expensive. So she was more interested about that association, the status that it gave her, yeah. et cetera, for her to be seen walking down a pretty uh, key area in Shanghai yeah. with this ice cream. I thought, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So how do we change that brand association with yeah. our product with them to make them yeah. feel better? Yeah. And and so was there anything that you did with that? Like, uh, Yeah, so part of it is, okay, the merchandising material yeah. where we have to do, create, et cetera, and all that yeah. sort of stuff around when they purchased the product and all that. We started to go down that, that path. Um, that was just before we ended up selling it, yeah. selling the business. But it was, yeah, just how do you... How do you make them feel good about the experience? Yeah. And again, uh, the biggest thing, like not if you or the listeners have been to uh, to China, it's completely different to to New Zealand life. Yeah. So the way they eat, the way they interact, the way they socialise, it's completely different. It's about creating those experiences. I was in Shanghai, uh, sorry, Guangzhou, one Friday night, walking down the street, and heaps of people. Around, What's going on here? And they had a lot. They had an LED display on the on the footpath, big white footpath, of a mountainous scene and water flow, and I go, oh, that's pretty bloody lame. But then as I was walking away, I thought, well, hang on a minute, that's a New Zealand lens yeah, yeah. on that situation. Yeah. I can what, drive half an yeah. hour and I'm in that real yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't, so that's how they're experiencing yeah. it. So eating our ice cream was like down to New Zealand, potentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and obviously you could even whip your marketing into that too, yeah. you know, have had that associated. Yeah. And I think that's the cool thing when you when you kind of step back around, you know, the experiences and the insights that they they really, really like, yeah. you know. I think... Uh, well, it reminds me of the story, wasn't that trip in Guangzhou, I was there with the uh, Anglis Guangzhou Food Services, so run a training session yep. around a product, how to promote it and, and sell it and all that sort of stuff. And I just made this, they were talking about the, oh, I was talking about the manufacturing process. So you get the cream and skim milk powder and all that, and you put it through the churn, and the churn whips it up, but yep. it's introducing air into it yep. to volumise it a wee bit. And I made the comment to the to the sales team, I said, yeah, it's even got New Zealand air in it. <laughs> and off the cuff comment like that, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, that was Hang the end on. of the day. I rolled back in there the next morning, and here's this big campaign around, it's got New Zealand air <laughs> and ice cream. <laughs> Oh, I, I like how good is that though, yeah. you know, like because that's another thing that would add to it. I, I remember yeah. going to Tikapo years ago, driving through as a sales rep and it would go to one of the stores there and there's this can of New Zealand air. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, 
I had a double take. I was like, they yeah. are selling air. And I was yeah. like, people are buying it. Yeah. So, hey, hey, but the, the coolest thing is, so then, you know, going up there and then all of a sudden someone, you know, someone wants to come buy it. Yeah, or well, sort of, kind of. We, um, again, on the growth trajectory, we needed uh, investment. Yeah. Uh, we needed needed more automate the process and everything else. There's a few things going on as well. <clears throat> Business partner decided he wanted out as well. So we sort of went through there and went looking for a um, investor to come into mm. the business. And we thought, right, the ideal one, we were sort of looking around other companies, looking down the road at Sinlay, yep. um, having a chat with John Pino down there and what they were doing, how they were doing at the Chinese investment, et cetera. Uh, so we sort of went down that path and went looking for a Chinese investor to mm. come in. Um, fortunately, worst decision I've ever made in my life. Oh, really? So, yeah, 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 yeah. To get rid of it? Uh, or putting it bluntly, the asshole that came in oh, right. and sort yeah. of bought into the business. Yeah. Um, he, he had other intentions around his, yeah. his true meaning and motives for it, yeah. so it made for an interesting journey yeah, yeah. for the next probably two years. All right. Yeah. Biggest learning? Biggest learning. Oh, big jeez. We're PG, uh, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking that. Um, yeah, I thought I'd done the right due diligence. I thought I'd engage with the right people to check out this person, but yep. yeah, it wasn't wasn't quite yep. um, up, up to speed. But also, after the event and, and self-reflecting back and looked at a few other businesses, what we went through was not uncommon yep. um, in regards to what other medium-sized businesses yep. had faced with Chinese investors. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying all yep. the Chinese investors like yep. this, no way meaning that, but there is, yeah, and again, any culture as well, there's yep. some sh shonky operators yep. out there. So, um, yeah, again, it's one of the learnings from it is make sure, because when we bought Deep South, um, business partner and I had another business going, shareholders agreement, all that, we're going good, yep. yeah, we'll just roll it into there, never got around to finalising a few things, so yep. when when uh, things started to unwind and unravel, et cetera, you go back to the shareholders agreement, yep. yeah, didn't actually sign that, did we? Oh, right. So a lot of learnings around yeah, yeah, that yeah. sort of side, so yep. again, part of what I'm doing in other part of life now is always with startup businesses is get that shareholders agreement yeah. signed up yeah. straight away which actually reminds me of another one I haven't done that yeah. uh, for myself actually um, so yeah lots of learnings coming yeah, yeah. around there yeah. mm. so so the business itself uh, your involvement when did you exit out of that uh, that was September 2016 early yeah. October and still, 2016 still going today like... yeah no that's again one of the successes around it so um, Tally's now in it yeah um, so uh, got to know Andrew Talley pretty well in regards to doing the Deep South journey. Mm. Uh, tried to get him to invest in it. He, he wasn't keen at the time, which was was all good. Um, then we sold to Dairy Works, so mm. just down the road. They got into ice cream, so it was a natural fit. Yeah. Uh, then Sinlay bought Dairy Works. Sinlay's only product they had that was frozen was mm. um, Deep South ice cream. Yep. So they wanted to sell that, and then Tally's bought it. So um, so I helped help tallies around that sort of process, etc. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, so again, where it's at now is pretty cool. And actually, uh, Dean Brosnan, who heads, heads up the tallies ice cream sort of side, he's up in Japan, uh, was it last week, two weeks ago, a, a picture of him with uh, Chris Luxon with Deep South. Yeah, there. Okay, good. So that was pretty cool, because back yeah. in 2013, I uh, had John Keith standing <laughs> with me with uh, Deep nice. South ice cream in the nice. So yeah, so it's a success story from yeah. that side. It's got yeah, yeah. bigger and better and gone on to better things. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Whereas potentially, if we hadn't, bought it back in 2010 it wouldn't have been there now no so. no no and and just i guess that those markets and then going and taking a new zealand brand to the market yeah, like yeah, yeah. pretty pretty cool yeah so so um obviously that business that you were doing you know you you're making things lean and, and then obviously manufacturing and putting that all together did you keep doing that like or once you got out of that were you, uh, were you looking at doing other things yeah oh, again that's sort of <clears throat> If I describe myself a bit of an efficiency junkie, yep. so that improvement sort of side of it. So um, when I finished up there, I took about six months off, etc. Um, and then we got approached by New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, um, COS. He was uh, a good guy, he's retired from there now. He was setting up a coalitions program, yep. three or more companies coming together to export together, which Brilliant. is what I had been doing at Deep South, mm. and we help each other yeah, out. Yeah. Um, so he came and asked me, oh, come into NZTE and help me set this up. So that's what I did. Yeah. Um, so I got to engage with a good number of companies in and yeah. around there. And where were you helping them go to, like all oh, over the world? Or Yeah, yeah. But again, primarily my experience background was China, yeah. Japan, Southeast Asia, for yeah. beverage. So that was sort of the bent that I had coming yeah. through. So um, yeah, did that for a couple of three years, but learned pretty quickly 
um, I wasn't the right fit in, in an organisation like that. Yeah. Um, just again, just mismatch. Right. Yeah. Like, I like to get things done pretty quickly yeah. and, and yeah. sort of flex along the way, etc. Um, but yeah, it served its purpose at the yeah. time, and it was a good organisation. Again, I very supportive of NZT. Yes. Yeah. Was, just wasn't for me. So. Any particular brands that you got involved with? Oh, yeah, quite a few of the wine companies, etc. Yep. Um, again, they were small to medium yep. ones coming in, but um, yeah, off the top of my head, can't remember. How, how, how is New Zealand positioned in the marketplace over the year? Think, like, are we are we do we, are we seen as a real brand as, as ourselves, or did you get that feeling, or, or you know, are we just still Australia's? Yeah, I can only really talk about in China again. My mm. experience up is probably four or five years old, so let's say it's still the same. But we were uh, that, that trusted uh, food product, that yep. was safe, um, clean, and clean. all that. And again, being in, in market, when you see the lives and the experience and the living conditions yeah. in China, um, it's it's that's the things that they they really value is what yeah. we have here. Yeah. So again, um, the one child policy as well I meant a lot of good food and products was mm. put into the kids, et cetera, yeah. and themselves. Um, so, again, we were focusing on the upper end sort of market, et cetera, yeah. so they were willing to pay for nice. higher, better quality product. So it definitely had its place in there. But, again, what we did learn up there, went to a few trade shows like Southern Alps Views, et cetera, you go to the food trade shows and it. Yeah, Switzerland's got that. Uh, Austria's got that. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yes. Yeah. Right, okay, you've got all that going on as well, but I think that the isolation of New Zealand sort yeah. of plays to the, the benefit as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Small, slow, some of those small things, but it's, yeah, people always say, I always, when people say, oh, New Zealand's green and green and all that sort of stuff, and then yeah, you go to Ireland and it's, yeah, it actually looks pretty awesome as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember skimming stones uh, at yeah. the Lake the Ring of Kerry yeah. on this lake, and the lake, this American lady told me off, and I was, we were like, well, it's just like our home, you know? Yeah, yeah. It did look, you know? Yeah, that's right. We're, we're not, we don't have a monopoly on that sort of nah, stuff. Nah. Hey, so medical recruitment. Yeah. Triple I. How did you how did you you get in, involved in another world? You know, like yeah. completely different, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, dealing with people. You know? Yeah, yeah, cool. So probably uh, to answer that, I'll probably go back to 89, 90. Mm -hmm. So initially, I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. Um, best remarks came out, missed on um, two or three best points to go straight into. Med school, I yep. do meant to med, yeah, into med school. Oh, geez, that means I need A pluses or whatever. The following, yeah, I'm yep. going to do that. So, what? Why did you want to be a doctor, by the way? Oh, I don't know. Just sounded cool. Yeah, sounded cool. I like science. Yep. I like maths. I like nice. that sort of stuff. Yep. Like problem solving. Yep. Trying to fix things and all that. So I missed on that. So in engineering. Um, but then again, 2016, I took time off. Um, Brother-in-law passed away, uh, cancer. A oh. um, few other sort of things in the background yeah. going on around there with close family members, etc. And then um, sort of started to look into the healthcare sector yeah. and just how um, mother-in-law passed away, misdiagnosis or late diagnosis, and you're saying, what's, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. So I started to look in through there and then... Um, they yeah, saw an opportunity come up to get into that sector. Um, again, related back to supply and demand, mm. there's a huge gap, right? Demand Massive. for healthcare professionals is high, supply is very low. Uh, that leads to interest in dynamics within mm. the market, particularly in the private health sector. Um, so how can things be improved in yeah. here? So that's why I sort of got into the medical gap. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a doctor, but I'm managing doctors, which yeah. is an interesting process yeah. in itself. And, and you're definitely playing a big part in that. And because let's be honest, the New Zealand healthcare system's in a bit of crisis, right? Like oh, we are, yeah. You know, yeah. we we really do, you know, you, you talked about supply and demand. Like yeah. the, the increase of supply is, oh, sorry, demand is, is you know, growing. growing. Mm. Um, and, you know, we're in a time right now where, where we just need more people. And, yeah. and we're, so, so, I guess the one of the other things, hopefully, that's going to come part of that is the technology yep. will catch up um, and, and play a big part into maybe helping um, as a as a whole industry as well. You know, but uh, you need people. Yeah, again, previous job as well, sort of. Um 
private specialists, etc. And you go and use the technology, uh, colonoscopies and the like, like you're going in there with a mm. the camera, well, I'm not, but the, the specialists are, mm. and they're looking for shapes, things, sh uh, colour, changes and all that sort of stuff. So straight away I'm thinking AI, facial recognition mm. technology and all that. How can we actually, and again, looking at consulting perspective, you look at accountants, lawyers and all that, is how do you leverage? Yeah. Right. How do you get more out of yourself in the mm. same time? Okay. Yeah. Actually, how do we how do we improve uh, or train up nurses, for example, yeah. to do colonoscopies? Yeah. Use AI technology, facial recognition technology, so the specialist is actually there on the screens, watching three or four different patients being uh, having the procedure done to. So how can that speed up, uh, increase capacity, mm. while you've still got one one um, specialist? But again, having the chat to a, um, a, a prominent uh, gastroenterologist around it. You just couldn't quite get that concept. Yeah. And uh, I'm always thinking about how can I do more for less, yes. right? Yeah, uh, yeah, there was totally. a way to do it, but couldn't quite grasp mm. it. So, um, and again, it's yeah, there, there's a role to play, but it will come in time. Yeah. It's just how do you, how do you take people on that journey yeah. to actually explore new ways? Yeah. Well, look, like some of the things I was um, have seen people do, you know, just using like the VR technology um, with the headsets, mm. you know, virtual reality and, you know, there's... I remember going to have a uh, MRI scan and it was quite daunting, you oh, know, yeah, going yeah. in that machine and stuff. And yeah. I was talking to a lady years and years later uh, about how they were using VR technology to get people to experience going into oh, the yeah, machine. Yeah. Um, so, because what they realised, if, if people couldn't go into the machine, mm -hmm. then that was someone that obviously had taken the place of someone else. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. so if you have a tendency that you get claustrophobic and stuff. Yeah, yeah. They were giving you those experiences using that um, yeah. those devices first. And I thought that was really, really smart because you need, you know, no people having the person freaking out yeah, um, yeah. and it taking longer or, or they just can't do it. Yeah. Versus taking the, the place of someone who could go in that machine. Yeah, yeah. I think little, where, where can we get in? little gains like that yeah. even in the health system? Well, that's right? like at the moment, or uh, Southern Cross Hospital here, they've got a robotic um, surgery capability there, but it's the might be wrong, but at the time the discussions around it, the utilisation of it wasn't there because health insurance wouldn't fund certain procedures on that machine using mm. the robot. Mm. Uh, whereas technically you, you could almost use that robot and the, the surgeon or the specialist is, I don't know, over in yeah. Asia or yeah. China or Germany or the UK or yeah. whatever because the, the technology is there to do it, yeah. but some of the other systems that aren't yeah. coming up to speed, keeping up yeah. to um, the change in requirements yeah. and what's needed. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's the thing that's probably holding a lot of those places back mm. to, you know, the same with facial recognition and to paying for a coffee and stuff. Yeah. The technology yeah, yeah. is there, but who wants to ensure, yeah, that's right. you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that it, yeah, so so what about like obviously you've got a you know a great team of, of, of people there and uh, your role now you know in yep. in that environment like with you obviously quite a people person. Is that a question or a statement? No, you are. You <laughs> are. You're, 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 you're a real. You you look. Yeah. I, you know, seeing behind the scenes, you're a real people person. What is it that you love about helping people achieve? Because you know, I've definitely seen that in, in in what you do on a day to day. Uh, oh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I don't know, just. Yeah, I like I like it when people can take that next step up themselves. Mm. And again, even with all my other businesses, if someone comes in and gives me a resignation or whatever, normally my first word is, oh, bugger. Yeah. And then the second thing is, where are you going? Yeah, yeah. Right? And if it's going on to something bigger and better, cool, nice. happy with that, because yeah. right? I've helped them go on to something bigger and better. So good. Um, and I probably 99% of them have all been like that. Um, one or two is, oh, great, like, they're out of here, problem solved. <laughs> um, but again, it, it's always, ha how can I help develop? What's yeah. pathways? What's career pathways? What's the next step? Mm. Um, and some people just happy in that role, right? Yeah. And happy in that role means they've got to be a happy work environment. You've got to have the right... Yeah, everything's got to be right around this. I just enjoy doing that, um, looking at what I can do to help that individual succeed, um, go further, uh, get better if they want to get better, um, mm. but then also help the business perform. Yeah. Because, again, I've sort of zigzagged across a number of sectors and all that sort of stuff, but to me, business is 80-20 rule. Yep. Right? Um, they're more or less the same. Mm. That last 20% is, is the flex or the, the challenges or the uh, situations presented in that sector. Yep. 
But if I four fundamentals of a business I look at is assets, people, processes, technology. Nice. Uh, the rest, finance, yeah, that's all we're given, right? But out of those areas there is what is your assets, right? You might have great assets, great processes, great technology, but if you've got bad people, yeah. right, you've wasted your time and efforts in those other yeah. first three areas. Yeah. But if you've got great people, they'll compensate for the deficiencies mm. in those other three areas. Yes, yeah. so, so true. Getting that right balance. So, And that's a big learning experience from me. Again, engineer, black and white, rah, rah, mm. rah, do this, do that. Um, experiences during the 2000s and the first probably five years of business, having my own business yep. and just seeing how people are reacting. Um, I think, oh, she's okay. So I can be quite direct in nature. Talk to my wife. She'll probably agree <laughs> on that. All right. Um, so again, it's, it's then learning to adapt. I might be saying something, and I always yep. say, look, if I say something direct, it's not meaning, but yeah. not everybody hears that. No. So it's how are they perceiving yeah. or receiving a message. Yeah. So that's where a lot of work on by for myself is around that people component. Yeah. And um, even today, we had a meeting this morning actually with the crew um, around some of the changes going on within Health NZ and all that. And you hear yep. what the media is saying, and you hear what government's saying. There's a massive mm. gap. So we were um, exploring what are we going to do, what are we going to do, and um, one of the team members, I thought, yeah, cool, right. She, she's she's starting to um, believe it, that she's capable of doing more. Yeah. So so it was quite cool watching that. Yeah. And seeing that come through in the discussions. Yeah. It's cool to see people that once the penny drops, eh? And they, yeah. And they go, hang on, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I can probably take a bit more here. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's giving them that space to do that too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Create the right um, environment. To yeah. Them. Yeah. And again, it's new coming into any role. One of the first things I'll normally say to people is, right, I might be direct, but I'm not meaning it personally. Right? Yeah. Um, so just just be aware of it if I can't just come in or what do you mean by that but then I always say to people right challenge the status quo challenge the norm mm -hmm. no idea is a dumb idea yeah. um, if you and I always say I'm going to ask you in two weeks time what's the one thing you've changed yeah right and um, part of that is to get them thinking about that they know their role they know know the business if I'm new coming in as well yeah. what's the one thing they really want yeah, to yeah. change and even when I was audited, I audited probably 100, 120 manufacturing sites. That was my last question. Mm. What's the one thing you would change? Nice. Uh, or get them to answer it, because that's normally the biggest problem. And yeah. The frustration. The frustration. And when you get those answers, what do you do as then as the... Yeah, again, yeah, sort of the, the problem solver of mm. me is, right, how, how do we address that? How yeah. do we fix that? Yeah. Um, or do you let them solve it? Yeah, yeah, so I was going to say, oh, normally nine times out of ten, I'll go, oh, there's an answer, but I've since learned to yeah. not give the answer. Yeah. And then again, sometimes my answer's completely off track. Yeah. Right? So again, it's how do we work that through as a team, which is back to creating that environment, yeah. of safe environment for them to actually raise ideas mm. and soundboard. Love that, eh? No ideas, a mm. stupid idea. Yeah. Let's talk it through and yeah. go from yeah. there. Yeah, and getting that collaboration on that sort of stuff, you yeah. know, because uh, especially... If it's the frustration they've brought up, they've probably thought about ways of solving it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. it's just not something that's just come up yeah. today. Um, yeah, well, the other part of it, like, like in previous job as well, <clears throat> they pro you comment there about they probably have thought of an idea, but some of them hadn't because they just knew they wouldn't be listened to. Wouldn't so be listened why, to. why bother yeah. actually suggesting it? So yeah. I'm not going to bother thinking about yeah. it. Yeah, 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 because it was not going to make a difference anyway. No. And I think that's the beautiful thing when you, you know, clean slate and you're open enough to say, hey, no, no idea is a bad idea. Mm. And by the way, you know, I, I love letting people find out their own answers. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's very freeing. Yeah. It's gone to the point now where people, you can see them walking over to me and they'll turn around. <laughs> and they'll go, because they know, they know exactly what I'm going to ask them. Or what, what, do you, what would you Yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. would you do? Yeah. Give me a couple of ideas and we'll yeah. discuss them, you know. Yeah. Because I think you've got to empower people, right? Yeah. And yeah, you've got, you've got to give people the, I guess the the ability to to grow it in themselves. Yeah. What um what have you learned about marketing over the years? You know, like you obviously you've seen a whole different array of marketing, and then obviously doing an MBA, and you would have learned some stuff. And yeah, you know, what have, what what's what's marketing to you? Marketing to me, again, this is the engineer's view on it. Um, so it's I always try and look at it from the other side. So what I mean by that is who, who, who am I trying to reach? Who is my market? What does the market look like? 
um, what's the different groupings within that market, um, how do I reach and connect and communicate and get the messaging mm. and everything else out to them. The only way I can answer that is trying to walk in their shoes yeah. or um, see it from their perspective. Like even at the moment with Triple O, what we're doing, we've got the candidates and the clients. Um, our team are really great. Um, they're probably probably too good on the candidate side. Yep. All right, because that that's where their strength is, and they're, they're almost like their mothers as well in terms mm. of the candidates. Whereas I've got okay, cool, that's that's great, but let's start looking at the client side yep. sort of side of it. Permanent placements versus locum placements. There's a place for both, mm. um, but where's the business at? All right, yeah. which is the hospital, etc. In, mm. in most cases. Yeah, yeah. So what side do we need to be looking at and concentrating on at the moment? So getting that 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 in order to get the marketing right and the messaging right and everything else, we need to understand who the audience is. Yeah. And um, we, we at the moment we we understand that the candidates real well, but do we understand the clients real well? Yeah. And again, that that's. There's a massive range within that yeah. space between public and private. Yeah. And then GPs versus hospitals yeah, and, yeah. and everything that goes on in between. Yeah. Mm. And and like because I like what you said though, though you gotta walk in people's shoes, right? Mm. So because if you can walk in the shoes of you know the clients and you can understand uh, sorry, the candidates, you, you can really uh, talk to those those people yeah. what they want, what they desire, yeah. what frustrates them and stuff. And obviously, you know, to some degree you, you can do the same. With the, with the clients, yeah. and then once you get into those all those different types of clients yeah, too, yeah, yeah. they all have different. Uh, yeah. you know, that's and that's where I guess marketing does become. Um, you know, it's it's a real art form, right? Mm. And and then it can be quite confusing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and you can miss. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as well, so you you really got to be prepared. You got to be prepared to one give things a go. Yeah. Um, to actually, you know. Um, but not everyone, not everyone is going to resonate with the same message. So yeah, 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 yeah. understanding yeah. that, well, that's yeah, sort of around that, that, the deep dive campaigns you guys are helping us with. Is one we've got going at the moment is the hospital. The next ones and around mm. GPs, etc. But hospitals and GP clinics are completely different. Mm. So the messaging is going to be different. Mm. Don't ask me how what it is, but that's why yeah. you guys are here, yeah. right? Yeah. So how do we craft that and get that right yeah. to attract attract the right audience to see the messaging yeah. we're putting out there? Yeah, because otherwise you become Blind, yeah, you know, yeah, you, yeah. You, people just don't see you because yeah. they nothing. It doesn't resonate, you know, no. like and and there and that's I reckon a you know a big part of of, of marketing is really digging mm. into those audiences and digging into, you know, what is it they want, what is it they need, what, what are their desires, what are their frustrations, and what are yeah. the problems that they're trying yeah, to solve, yeah. you know, and and really under, understanding that because if I, I always remember learning you know copywriting back in the day. And I remember as my mentor would always say to me, Scott, they're on the couch. How are you going to get them off the couch? You know, and like you, you had to get them off the mm. couch. So what are you, you know, to get them off the couch, sometimes you have to lay on that couch. Bad, and yeah. you have to get into their mind and their mindset and walk a day in their shoes. And, you yeah. know, it's not to, you, you, you kind of start to see that. You go, whoa, you know, mm. it's, 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 um, it's, not as, it's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah. Um, okay, so what else have you learned? I, I love your engineer's view. Um, I, I think that's quite quite interesting. What else have you learned about um, you know the marketing side of, of, of the business? Uh, Why, well, like, if I relate it back to the business, mm. um, I, what's our point of difference? Mm. How can we stand apart? Um, how can we be seen as better? Mm. Right. So, so from that sort of side of it, looking at it from there is okay. How do we then? get that that message and that marketing sort of story out yeah. there so i'm i like to look at right what, what's our competitors doing yeah all right um what are we doing is it exactly the same as them well how are we going to stand apart so then again with having zigzagged across different sectors i always then look at okay what can i take or what have i learned elsewhere that we're going to try mm. here so again um nice. the recruitment sort of side of it i'm thinking right actually we're trying to attract GPs coming over from overseas, right? Okay, how's that any different, say, the university trying to attract students from overseas mm. to come to the university? Yeah, yeah. So what are they doing? Um, what's the the private schools, what are they doing? So yeah, yeah. What, what's happening there yeah. that we can take and, and use in, in our sort of marketing uh, toolbox yeah. to try and attract 
uh, not only the candidates to us, but then also yeah. the, our clients to us as well. Mm. So how do we stand apart from our, our competitors? Yeah. So um, so that, that, that there's some um, good insights there. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. The um, what I like to try and do is try things new. Yeah. Right. Um, if it fails, it fails. Right. What do we learn? Yeah. So if we've learned something from it, well, it's not really a failure. Yeah. yeah exactly. Right, we can take that and go for the next one. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because like, people have choices, right? This, yeah. you know, they, I think they've got three choices. They can buy from you, they can buy th from the competitors, your competitors, or they can do nothing, mm. right? And I think you've got to, you've, you know, you've got to have that point of difference that they choose yeah, you. Yeah. Why should they do business with you? Mm. You know, I teach people, write a list of everything, you know, someone should to choose you. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and really write that list of why they should choose you. I do like your insight there, though, is going to, okay, these people are trying to attract people mm. what are they doing you yeah, know and, yeah. and going and learning from that yeah. kind of like ties back into the collaboration you were doing with yeah, the exporters just, yeah, you know right. yeah. how those exporters were you bring yeah. them together to go yeah you know so it's very oh, i like that and i think a lot of as a business owner if you're listening to this you could definitely do that you could look okay well what are some of those other industries that are trying to do the same thing mm. you know um that are you know, even if, the, well, they'll be probably non-compete to your industry, but they you know, learn what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. It's very cool, very cool. Yeah. How do you how do you keep your mind sharp? What's your... You know? uh, oh, I'm looking at your bookshelf over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I love to read books, yep. uh, podcasts. Physical or, books? You, you like a physical uh, book? Yeah, both, actually. Yeah. So the old tablet here, yeah. I've got e-books on there. Yeah. Um, but again, it's... Sitting in the chair with a whiskey, reading the book. Yeah, nice. I quite like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, again, it's sort of that traditional approach, and again, getting off technology as yeah. well. Um, so yeah, a combination of all things. Yeah, um, I'm an active thinker. Yep. Uh, so I go to the gym, I run, I cycle, walk the dog, all that sort of stuff. So when I'm out there doing that by myself, I've normally got the podcast on, listening to something. Yep. Uh, Any type of um, podcast you listen to, like? Uh... Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, I've been listening to a lot of these ones over yeah. the last uh, couple of months. But, you know, again, majority, or even the books, I read majority of them are business related. So, yeah. right, what do I need to learn about? What do I need yeah. to refresh on? So, again, health tech, I'm involved in another business, um, helping set that up, which, again, is around uh, hair dye, which doesn't yeah. work for me. <laughs> right, but again, that's yeah. the health tech bent in the back. Yeah. So, listening to podcasts around that sort of side of things. Um yeah, yeah, just the people side, organisational development. Um, yeah, uh, just yeah. I, I, I love reading books, um, and and I I think I would have read eighty percent of those books, and that's only a small selection of the books yeah. that I actually have. But um, I remember being in the UK, and um, I never really read a book, and. Um, a guy I was working for, um, his building company, he said, we're going to Spain to his house, and he said, you know, there's not much to do. He said, we were doing some work there, but, you know, we'll go buy some books. And I was like, I am reading a book. You know, because I was from the old school at school, you, you got told what to read, and I didn't really get uh, it, I didn't yeah, really understand yeah, yeah. it. And he, and he saw me in the bookstore, and I was just walking around aimlessly, and he goes, Scott, you can choose a book. You can choose any book you want. And, yeah. and it, something went off in my head. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, oh, you can choose whatever book you want. Yeah. And I remember the first book I read cover to cover was um, Dennis Rodman, As Bad As I Want to Be. Oh, yeah. And it was yeah. a fascinating story. Yeah. And, and it kind of lit my thirst for, for reading. And I was actually reading something last night. And I just, this is why I love reading. And I was reading a book. And it's, it's, it's by a guy... Oh, I'm going to butcher his name, but um, he wrote the psychology of money, oh, and right. he's just written a book, uh, basically the same as everything. And he talks about how, you know, a lot of things um, we always we always look at the future and go, "What's the future going to be like?" And he goes, he just basically says, "Well, actually, just look at the past and look at the things that haven't changed and that are not probably going to change." Oh, yeah. And it's quite an interesting way of thinking. But he was talking about storytelling, and I love this part because he's talking about how the best storytellers win. And from a marketing mm -hmm. perspective, I love this. And, and yeah, he was yeah. talking about, he was actually talking about um, Martin Luther King. And we all know I had a dream story, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Well, that was kind of not a mistake, but it wasn't part of the script oh, to, yeah. to, to do that talk. You know, that talk, he had a script writer who had <clears throat> written out his, his, his talk. Five minutes in, um, the script is on the thing, and someone keeps yelling at him. Martin who was a friend of his tell him about the dream tell him about the dream and apparently he paused pushed it aside put the script oh, away wow. and for the next five minutes told him about the dream 
Correct. And 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 I just thought, wow, what a story, you know. Yeah, and, and like, even now yeah. you're thinking, oh, how that's different. How cool is that? Yeah. And like, you know, that was I read that. And I read yeah, that last yeah. night, and I didn't know about that. Yeah, and yeah. I just thought, how good is you know when when you can get good at storytelling, and yeah, yeah. that story changed you know the world, and and in a lot of ways in America, mm-hmm. there wouldn't be many people that haven't heard. Uh, I have a dream, but they haven't heard the reason or why it came about, you know. And I just yeah, think, yeah. what a what a what a what a powerful way. And you get that from reading, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's quite cool. Me and my wife were on the couch, and my son was reading as well. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's so very very cool. Yeah. What's your favorite book that you've read? Did you have any? Oh yeah, got a few. Ones? Um, uh, one again around sort of governance. Uh, the fish rots from the head. All right. Yeah. I'll so that. uh, that's out of the states. It's a whole lot of case studies around companies that um, uh, basically went belly up. Yeah. Didn't perform. And okay, again, good. it's all about that. That leadership starts at the top. So yeah. Governance down to CEO, etc. Coming in through. Yeah. You, you got to lead from there. Um, good to great. Jim Collins. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot, lot of stuff taken out of there. Uh, Michael Porter, his old competitive yep. strategy, and yep. I still refer back to even this morning's meeting with the team, I was sort of talking about that. Um, so that's sort of at the forefront, just reading another version of that in terms of how to understand it or interpret yep. it a bit more. Uh, what else is out there? Oh, back in the 90s, I read a bit of old Jack Welsh's book, The yep. GE Way. Yeah, yeah, nice. So, again, a lot of learnings. Again, as you say, some of his thinking's old school, not the new way now, mm. but there's still some great lessons yeah. in through there. ABC, in terms of classification yep. of people. Yeah. Um, I used that the last couple of weeks with the team as well, in terms of how we classify our crew. Just say, oh, what is it? Are they an A or a B or a C? Let me know. And, and nice. then straight away, you know yeah, 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 the yeah. person you're talking about. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of some of the main ones. Oh, oh there's a real good one at the moment. McKinsey's have put out a book, uh, CEO Excellence. Okay. So that's all about, again, looking at the uh, US market, et cetera, and all that good stories yep. around the CEOs and what makes them tick. What makes them tick. So again, real. That'd be a good read. Yeah, it is, yeah, actually. Yeah. And then for non-business stuff, I've got one book to read yeah. in the Jack Reacher, and I've read oh, all his, all wow. his books. Oh, wow. good. So that's the uh, the reading for Maluda Bar next week. Nice, nice. Yeah. Oh, so good. The great video, uh, great um, uh, Prime series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, yeah. very cool, very yeah. cool. I, um, the, the Fish Rots from the Head, I haven't read the book, but I've been involved in the company uh, when I was in the corporate world and saw that happen. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. saw it just happen, yeah. played out, met the guy, shook my hand, it was an Australian guy, he shook my hand, it was like shaking hands of a wet fish. Yeah. We didn't hedge on the spot market, we were losing a million dollars a day six months later. Yeah. And and the company you know, was bleeding. And then I actually, I was part of the commercial side, and then the residential side, I, I witnessed uh, 200 to 300 people get made redundant. Oh, wow. In, in, in like 10 minutes. No, I'm over at Wordsworth Street here in yeah. Christchurch, and, oh, yeah. and, and I just remember that, that just said to me, and, and he didn't actually do the firing, he brought another guy in no, to do the firing. Yeah. Um, and I just thought to myself, weak leadership, you know, yeah, it was really, yeah, and yeah. then and then the next guy came into the company, um, and another, another Aussie guy um, put on a barbecue for us, the 40 kind of commercial guys, all came around, shook your hand, mm. straight in the eye. Yeah, what yeah, are you yeah. up to? What do you need? Blah blah blah. It was amazing how yeah, yeah, like the yeah. company had just turned around. Like yeah. it was just well, obviously it was a lot smaller company because uh, we had to sell the the other side, the asset side. But it was a, it was a, it was incredible to me to witness two types of leadership. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. just to see how truth that is. The fish rots on the head. Eh? Yeah, it's like yeah. it's incredible, incredible. Hey, I'm gonna put you on the spot. We got we got a couple right. of minutes. We got a couple cool. of minutes. So I'm gonna put you on the spot. If you had um, if you had to start a business again today in this market, well, give me five things that you'd do. Jeez. No pressure. No pressure. From your experience, five things. No, what would no, I do? What would I do? Uh, you can say what you do from a marketing point of view, yeah. from a business point of view, whatever you... Whatever so you if I was going to start today, I'd have a clear understanding of what it looks like in five years. Yep. All right. Okay. Uh, five and, yep. And part of that is... Uh, what happens at that point as well? Am I setting it up for long term? I'm setting it up to sale yep. and what it's about. So it's sort of getting the the bookends in place yep. right, in terms of what's going to be done. That'll be number one. Um, assuming I've already done the due diligence and market research, et cetera. Next one, I'll be looking at the people Yep. Right, in terms of um, getting the right people on board, yep. uh, not just from a skill set, but yep. uh, um, EQ, right? Yep. Uh, empathy, all that sort of stuff is key. Right, IQ will get you so far, but um, it'll get you in negative places yeah. as well. So, yeah. right, team mix around yeah. there. Uh, I'd then be looking around that whole how to do things smarter, right? So around the business model of it yeah. is 
what's AI and uh, automations, all that sort of stuff. I've got old chat GPT 4.0, the paid version on yeah. or 4.0, like yeah. looking at what that can do and speed yeah. things up. Yeah, leverage so, A. Yeah, dead right. Um, and part of that is what, so again, then the, the old marketing strategy around there is how am I going to get that reach, right? Yeah. Whoever it might be, how am I going to make them know that we're here and yeah. what we're doing? And more importantly, the last part is making sure that that messaging is going out is how am I going to solve the problems or yeah. make things better or, um, yeah, get it right for the for the person that's paying for whatever it is. Yeah, and that really comes down to understanding who, mm. the who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Who and then uh, you know who who do you help? Why they should buy from you? Being very yeah. very clear on that, um, and, I, and I think that's that's a thing that a lot of people just don't do. Yeah, they don't get yeah. clear on their who who can who wants to who can, and then then they don't spend enough time being relevant. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. or becoming relevant to 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 that who. So, yeah. hey, I think they would start a pretty good business. I like that. I, I like what you said about the five year vision, but I like what you said about okay, what happens next? Mm. You know, plenty of people get to that point, but they haven't thought about the, yeah. the next part. Well, that sort of got old um, Jeff Ross's book, um, Every oh, Bastard yeah. Says No. Yeah, yeah. So that was one of the key takeaways I had about there is he, when he said, right, we're going to go do this, it was about selling it in, in the future or whatever. Yeah. And that then allowed him to create his pathway, if I remember it rightly, and the way I sort of describe it being the uh, the wee fox terrier yapping at the heels of Picardy yep. to annoy them so yeah. they bought him out, which is yeah. what happened. What happened? Yeah, so then you can plot your course of getting to that end point. I met some uh, well, some mates of mine, met him the other day uh, oh, on yeah. a project where we're doing with, with a company that we deal with. And um, one of the guys was like, oh, why are we going to see this guy? You know, blah, blah, blah. I didn't really want to see him. Left going, oh my God, I was so wrong. <laughs> so glad we met him. He's a, yeah, a real yeah. deal. And he's making some big inroads yeah. for, for thinking differently in a sector that needs to think differently. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, yeah. which, is, which is fascinating. Hey, Mike, this has been awesome. Cool. I really appreciate yeah, you coming it. on the podcast. Is there any other words of wisdom you want to leave <sighs> people with? Or? Like I think we've, we've, we've covered a lot. I yeah. like the fact that you're starting to think about you know AI and automation and leverage. It's something that I really yeah. believe um, you can actually help your people with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and get them using it and get them finding. You know, we have a how do you get an hour back in your week yeah, yeah, yeah. scenario. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what what people. Well, there's a lot of rubbish AI out there, but. Yeah. Go and search for the good stuff for the role that you actually have and empower your power empower the people to actually find the good stuff that actually helps them. You'd be amazed what, what's out yeah. there and, and it's only gonna get better. Yeah. It's about last takeaway again, assuming that if you're looking to get into business, right, you got the business purpose, what's the personal purpose? Mm. Making sure those are aligned. Nice. And that, that changes over time. Like yeah. when I set up first business, etc. Cheryl and I were married, kid on the way, etc., doing the MBA. I, my risk profile was well, yeah. was open to risk at that yeah. time, right? Uh, would have sold deep south, etc. I looked at going back into the next next hit. Yeah. But at that time, three kids at primary school, intermediate, yeah, high yeah. school, a uh, few other things going on. So yeah, let's take the same yeah, option, yeah, yeah. right? So um, so that's why I went and got employed. Hmm. But now I've got one eldest is at uni, uh, middle ones two years or. Year and a half to go at high school. Youngest just started high school, mm. so oh, okay. Now we've got yeah, yeah. risk profiles changing yeah, yeah. a wee bit. Yeah, good. Risk appetite, I should say. Yeah. So again, it's making sure that alignment. So yeah, um, yeah I'm starting to think of maybe some more risky things, etc. That's, that's kind of cool. Look at. To, yeah, cool, cool to think about that mm. where you are personally. I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Because it ebbs and flows and yeah. changes over time. How yeah. good. How good. All right. Hey, cool. appreciate you coming on the podcast, guys and girls. Great podcast today. One job, you've only got one job, and that's to share the podcast. Look, we are, we um, every week are bringing you people that can add value to your business, but let's add some value to other people's businesses that are not listening. So please share the podcast. Tag us in on LinkedIn. Tag us in on uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and share the podcast. Mike's giving us some great tips here today. And, and you know, you look, if you know someone who's looking at exporting and th things like that, like share the podcast. Um, and if you're a doctor uh, or a nurse or, or you're looking to come to come to New Zealand, check out Triple O. Exactly. Um, we'll put all the contact details. So we'll put all your contact details yep. um, and people can reach out to you uh, and, and, and find out some more. All right, hey, thanks for your time. Have a great day. And remember, take action.